Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and this is your yearly horoscope forecast for the zodiac sign of Capricorn for the entire year ahead of 2022. If you're new to my channel, then my name is Chris Brennan, and I'm the host of the Astrology Podcast and the author of a book on ancient astrology titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune. So in my approach, I synthesize a little bit of ancient and a little bit of modern astrology in order to get the best of both worlds. So each week I release new podcasts and videos on astrology on my channel, so if you'd like to get notifications when I release a new video, then please hit the subscribe button here on YouTube, and if you enjoy this video, then please consider hitting the like button to show me that you enjoyed the content and you'd like to see more of it. Okay, so my horoscopes are primarily meant to be read relative to your rising sign or your ascendant sign, which are essentially the same things. Although you can also watch them from the perspective of your sun sign, especially if you're born during the day, or your moon sign, especially if you're born at night. So the rising sign changes signs every hour or two during the course of the day, whereas the moon sign takes about two days to change signs, and the sun sign takes about a month to change signs. So as a result of that, the rising sign is much more personally relevant to you, and for that reason, I would really focus on that when you're looking at these horoscopes, or horoscopes in general for that matter. So if you don't know what your rising sign is, then all you need to do is find out your birth time and then go to a website where you can get your birth chart calculated, such as astro.com, and you should be able to get your ascendant or your birth uh, rising sign calculated on those websites. So I have a video tutorial titled How to Calculate Your Ascendant and Rising Sign on my channel, which you can either search for or, or I'll put a link to it in the upper corner of this video right here. So let me know in the comments below what your sun, moon, and rising signs are, and which sign resonates with you more when you watch your video horoscopes like this one. All right, Capricorn, let's get into your astrological transits for 2022. So let's start by looking at the transit chart, which shows where the planets will start at the beginning of the year and how far through the signs of the zodiac they'll get by the end of the year. The first transit that I really want to start with, which we begin with at the very top of the year, is the Venus retrograde cap Venus retrograde transit in Capricorn, which is taking place in your first house of self and mind and body. So the first house, here's a chart that shows the significations of this the first, which include uh, not just body and mind, but also one's character and one's appearance. So um a Venus retrograde transit in the first house can sometimes indicate a period in which you go through uh, a period of revisions in terms of thinking about your appearance and how you present yourself to the world. So sometimes this can be a period of introspection or reflection. Um, this transit did begin actually towards the end of last year in December of 2021 when Venus actually first went retrograde in the sign of Capricorn conjunct Pluto. But it's a transit that's not going to be over until early March when uh, eventually Venus will depart from the sign of Capricorn for the final time. So here we see it there, departing from Capricorn on March 6th. So we still have a ways to go, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to start with this transit. So um, Venus stationed retrograde conjunct the planet Pluto. So there may have been some incident that sort of set this off or triggered this period of introspection or self-reflection for you that was maybe a little bit tricky or not very positive, because uh, Pluto can represent very intense interactions and sometimes power dynamics between people. So sometimes this can be about relationship things like a tense love relationship or romantic relationship where there's issues of like control or power or sometimes domination involved. Um, but for you, it may have set off some sort of period of introspection in terms of thinking about what you need in relationships and better identifying your sense of self, uh, appearance, but also character and how you want to present yourself to the world. And in some instances, ways that you can improve the way that you present yourself, not just in terms of you know basic physical appearance type things, although that and having some sort of makeover is sometimes um, in the purview of a Venus retrograde transit, but sometimes it has more to do just with um, character traits that you have and maybe things about yourself from your past that you 
always wanted to work on and improve in order to present yourself more effectively or in a way that's more reflective of who you are internally as a person, but that you've never put a lot of effort into, this would be a good time to do that now. So sometimes um, the first house can also relate to the physical body. So there can be things that we want to improve physically about our health or just our day-to-day -day functioning in t terms of our physical vitality. And this can be a good time to focus on that and try to improve some health-related things, get into new uh, diet or exercise regimes and things like that in order to um, improve their overall functioning of our physical body. So some of this is going to be heightened, and we're going to see an increase in the intensity and the speed of events with respect to some of this transit in late January when the planet Mars ingresses into Capricorn and into your first house where it will join Venus. So this is kind of important because Mars tends to speed up the pace of events whenever it ingresses into a new house. So some of the first house themes that we were just talking about with Venus will suddenly gain more focus, more intensity, and the pace of things will start to quicken. So this may be a period in which you just find yourself having to work a lot more, having to expend more energy and more effort doing things, like maybe a major project of some sort. And um, that can be okay. It can be actually a very productive period, especially for those of you with night charts. I think some of these transits are going to be pretty smooth and pretty constructive. Um, for you, those of you with day charts, the ingress of Mars into your first house can be a period in which some of the Mars energy can become a little bit too much and can kind of bubble over and indicate a period in which you could be more irritable than normal. Um, you could be more become more argumentative psychologically or more um, prickly than usual. So you might want to be careful about the potential for, you know, getting into needless conflicts or um, being too divisive in some way, especially if it's uncalled for in a given situation. So Mars transits can also t coincide with um, themes of conflict, strife, separation. Since the first house represents not just your mind and your character, but also your physical body, sometimes we have to exercise a little bit of extra caution during Mars transits to the first house because we can tend to act a little bit more impulsively without thinking first. And sometimes when we do that, it can open us up to um, accidents and basically taking actions where we're not thinking things through or we move too quickly or too fast and we accidentally get ourselves into a situation that we later regret or, or that we would have avoided if we had thought it out a little bit first. So try to be a little bit careful during this time period of late January through early March when Mars is transiting through your first house. So that transit ends on March 6th when Mars and Venus both simultaneously on the same day exit from Capricorn and move into the sign of Aquarius. So that's the first transit I wanted to focus on because it lasts for the first two or three months of the year. The next transit I wanted to move on to talking about is Jupiter has recently moved into Pisces, which is your third house, and it's going to be transiting through your third house for the first three or four months of 2022. So the third house represents things like siblings, short distance travel, education, but also communication. So a Jupiter transit through your third house can be a great time to improve the way that you communicate and express yourself to the world. So it can be a period in which you learn new communication styles, in which you find more effective ways to, to communicate your thoughts and internal feelings. You may take on new communicating um, sort of methods or like modes of social media or things like that and find yourself being particularly active and successful in those areas at this time. Um, it can also be a good time for improving things in terms of your relationship with certain third house uh, characters or parties. So the third house represents people like siblings, so improving your relationship with your siblings if you have any. It can also represent um, extended relatives like aunts and uncles and cousins. Uh, or it can also represent neighbors, like people either that you live with who are in a neighbor relationship to you or that are in your neighborhood 
sort of outside of your house, but in your general vicinity or in your city. So it can in- indicate a period in which some of those interactions are more positive or more fortuitous for some reason over the course of the first several months of this year. Uh, the last thing is um, the only thing to be a little bit tr- careful about when it comes to this transit is that Jupiter is actually going to conjoin Neptune in early April uh, in the sign of Pisces. That's actually going to go exact on April 12th. And that can be a little bit tricky because sometimes um, Neptune transits can be really um, enjoyable subjectively in terms of having this illusory quality that makes things look kind of like a fairy tale or look very ideal. So for you, for example, if you were trying to communicate something that had a sort of like magic to it or a sort of creative flair to it, for example, if you were doing creative writing or if you were writing about like fantasy worlds or something like that, um, that could actually be a really great transit for that. The ability to communicate and convey something that is somewhat illusory or to paint a very vivid picture in terms of your third house communication style during this time. Um, the downside is that Neptune can sometimes be uh, a little bit deceptive, where um, things can be not quite what they seem or not what they're what not like what they initially seemed at first, but instead can come off as like being really great, but then you get to the other side of the transit and you think you realize that things were not quite as positive as they were initially conveyed. So um, that could be something where you're, in terms of communication, you want to be careful that you don't have any issues with being deceived in terms of your communication during this time, especially around the time of that conjunction, but also in terms of your interactions with third house figures like siblings, um, neighbors, or extended family and relatives. Just make sure um, if you enter into any agreements during this time that you aren't being deceived in some way, even if accidentally somebody may present something to you which um, you need to read, sort of dot all your I's and cross all of your T's, especially if you're signing any contracts or anything during this time, since sometimes Neptune's sort of deceptiveness can be overt and deliberate, but other times it can be something where it's just a matter of you not being clear and having a misunderstanding when you're going into some contract. So for that reason, it's a good idea to be a little bit careful and just pay pay attention and make sure that you're being extra clear about things during this time. All right, so that transit of Jupiter through Pisces is happening. Um, It started in December, late December of 2021. And it's going to last all the way until May 10th when Jupiter moves into Aries. So there will be a one month period towards the end of the year where Jupiter will retrograde back into Pisces and some of that energy will come back between October 28th and December 20th. But the main thrust of it really is in the first uh, four months, basically, of this year of 2022. So I want to move on next and talk about what happens after Jupiter leaves Pisces that actually moves into the sign of Aries which is your fourth house of home, family, parents, and your private life, opposite to your 10th house, which is like your career and your public life. So here's your fourth house, which is Aries. Um, Jupiter transits through Aries and through the fourth house can be a great time for improving or sort of sprucing up your home and living situation. So if things have been rocky in terms of your home and living situation for the past little bit, this can indicate a a several-month period in which things are suddenly much more bright or much more optimistic. Jupiter is the planet of growth and expansion, but also the confirmation of good things. So sometimes it could indicate just like getting that, that ideal or that dream home that you always sort of wanted, at least relative to whatever your current circumstances are at this time. In other instances, it can be about just improving whatever your current living situation is and finding ways in order to grow and develop and expand and create a a more solid foundation in your home base. So other fourth house topics can be the family and especially the parents. So this could be a good period if you've had any challenges in terms of your family or your parents in the past to smooth things over or to improve that relationship with whatever your 
parental figures are, your mother or father or what have you. Um, it can also be a period where things are, could just be going relatively well, or there could be something positive that happens in the lives of one or both of your parents, which then sort of we see just an echo of in your chart. So that's one of the weird things sometimes about astrology is sometimes transits to houses other than the first house represent things that are happening in the lives of those around you. So in this instance, it would be something happening in the lives of your parents or your family. So that's a pretty positive transit. It's probably one of the most positive transits you have going on this year in terms of the home and living situation. And that's really taking place primarily from May 10th through October 28th, although it's actually going to come back at the very end of the year from December 20th, and it's going to stay in Aries all the way until May of 2023. So that is a two-part transit that we are just getting the first half of essentially this year, um, but then it'll continue on into 2023. All right, um, moving forward, we've talked about Jupiter. Next, I want to talk about Saturn, which is your ruling planet, which is transiting through the second half of Aquarius this year. And the second house is the place of finances, of possessions, and generally your income in general or your, your resources in general, we could say. So Saturn has been going through your second house of finances off and on for the past couple of years. It first dipped in there around March or April of 2020, very briefly for, for two or three months, and then it retrograded out. And then finally, Saturn moved back firmly into Aquarius about a year ago in December of 2020. So we've had a full year of this transit where Saturn is indicating a period of consolidation and a little bit of slowing down when it comes to financial matters for you. So over the past year of most of 2021, this was balanced out by Jupiter, which was also transiting through Aquarius in your second house, which was indicating a sort of contrasting signification of growth and expansion in your second house of finances, which is helping to even out Saturn's more um, sort of pulling back and consolidating type significations. So now with Jupiter leaving and moving into Pisces, um, it sort of leaves Saturn a little bit to its own devices. So you may have to continue that process of restructuring some things when it comes to your income and comes to your, your financial outlook in general. So some people during this period just have to go through a period of learning how to do with less or not having as much abundance compared to other times in their life. But eventually, um, you know, there's there's two scenarios. There's the constructive uh, surmountable difficulty scenario where it's like something comes up where there's an obstacle that you have to overcome in terms of your financial outlook, but then through great striving and effort, you're actually able to come out on top and learn from it and improve and come out better as a result, which is one scenario, especially for those of you with day charts. Um, on the other side, sometimes there could be just some sort of roadblock or some sort of stop sign that completely stops you in your track in terms of some financial issues where you just cannot proceed further down that path and instead have to go a completely different direction where perhaps some manner of income will be cut off, some mode of income might be cut off for you for a period of time. So whatever this is, you've probably already been experiencing it off and on over the past year or two, so it's probably not something new, but instead it's something you've already been dealing with for a while and you've already got a pretty good handle on. So what we're doing now is we're just following through with the second half of this transit as Saturn moves through the second half of Aquarius and then eventually wraps things up early next year. So this transit's going to be over um, by March of 2023 when Saturn leaves Aquarius and moves into the sign of Pisces. So that gives you a sort of end date to sort of look forward to, to, to help you plan around things and maybe just give you, you know, an idea to keep in your head that there is an end point to it or a sort of light at the end of the tunnel if there have been any challenging financial issues that have come up over the past year or two. All right, so connected with that, 
Mars is going to conjoin Saturn in the sign of Aquarius on April 4th. And I wanted to mention this because um, this could bring some of the Saturn things that you've been experiencing in the second house of finances could become more acute during this time. So that transit will really start on March 6th as soon as Mars moves into Aquarius, which is your second house, where it will start moving towards a conjunction with Saturn. It will peak around April 4th and 5th when Mars exactly conjoins Saturn, and then eventually the transit will be over um, around the middle of the following month, around April 14th, when Mars departs from Aquarius and, and moves into Pisces. So as I talked about before, um, Mars transits sometimes just speed up or quicken the pace of events. So you may find yourself having to work a lot harder and work a lot longer hours in order to make an income during this time. Maybe there's a project or there's something going on that just forces you to work a lot more during this time in order to make money. Um, this can be a productive uh, transit, but sometimes it can just coincide with a lot of anxiety and a lot of tension where you feel like you're being pulled in two different directions where there's something that there's one energy that wants you to move really fast and there's another energy that wants you to move slow and so you're constantly going back and forth between those two and trying to find balance or moderation between the two of them which can be difficult or or sort of tricky um so if you have to put in a lot of work during this time, just know there is an end point and it will only last for about a month. Um, one possibility with Mars is that Mars can always indicate periods of like strife and anxiety and separation. So you want to be careful um, about taking risky financial uh, sort of attempts or, or ventures or schemes at this time because Mars can sometimes either um, in a natal chart, for example, Mars in the second can sometimes indicate periods where a person spends too impulsively. So they spend a bunch of money impulsively and that ends up impacting them negatively as a result. So that's something you might want to be careful about during this time. Um, Mars transits can also sometimes indicate like the taking away of something. So sometimes in the second house there can be an issue with like a loss of finances or like theft or something like that. So I would just be extra careful during this time because it's one of the more sensitive transits especially um, for those of you with day charts, that Mars transit can be a little bit more tricky, whereas for those of you with night charts, um, it'll probably be a bit more constructive of a period of time when it comes to finances. All right, so the next transit I want to mention, which is also tied in with the Saturn transit, is that um, Saturn has been squaring Uranus off and on over the course of the past year. And we already had three exact hits of that transit. The, the most recent one was towards the end of 2021. But there's going to be one more really close pass of this square between Saturn and Uranus, which is going to take place in the third quarter of the year, especially around September and October. So Uranus has been transiting through your fifth house, which is the house of children, creativity, um, pleasure, also sex and sexuality. And Uranus is kind of a liberating energy that can shake things up and bring a lot of innovation to that area of our life or a lot of unexpected changes. So there's Uranus in your fifth house, and it's squaring or creating some sort of tension between those fifth house topics and some of the second house topics having to do with money, finances, income, and possessions. So you've probably already been experiencing some of these tensions between that area of the second house of finances and the fifth house of children, uh, creativity, and sex and sexuality over the past year or so, year and a half maybe. But there's going to be one more pass of that in terms of working out whatever the tension is or the dynamic between that area. So some possibilities, for example, of tensions between the second and fifth house. I've seen things like. Um, an issue in terms of making enough money in order to support having an unexpected child, for example, and that changing the financial outlook of things in a way that was been challenging in terms of the person's finances. Or alternatively, um, having a separation in a relationship, which leads to a person um, having to pay like child support or something like that would be a delineation of second house of finances with fifth house of children. 
or maybe there's something about your creative outlook and creative impulses where you've been pursuing some sort of creative or artistic um, career, which has been very liberating and exciting for you, but it's been kind of tough financially over the past year or two as a result of that. So those are just a couple of just more specific possible delineations of this broader archetype. But I mainly just want you to think about how there may have been some tensions in those two areas of your life and ways in which you could reconcile that during the course of the year or find some sort of way to balance out those two parts of your life. So part of the reason that is important is because we're going to start seeing more activity in that sector of your chart this year due to the recent beginning of a series of eclipses in your 5th and 11th houses in the signs of Taurus and Scorpio. So let's move on and talk about those eclipses in Taurus and Scorpio in your 5th and 11th houses. So I've already mentioned the 5th house significations like children, creativity, and sexuality. The 11th house has to do with friends, groups, and alliances, as well as your hopes for the future. So eclipses are going to take place um, in those two houses and in that sector of your chart and are going to highlight those topics. And my primary keyword for eclipses is they represent great beginnings and great endings. So major beginnings and major endings when it comes to this area of your life and the topics associated with it. So for some of you, fifth house eclipses can indicate like major developments when it comes to having children. Like for example, if you've been planning on having children or if having children is a possibility, it could be the starting point for that or a new beginning could be literally like having a child. Um, if you already have children, it could be some sort of new turning point with respect to either your child's life and their overall development in life, or it could be something about a new chapter when it comes to your relationship with them at this time. Um, definitely be careful if you weren't planning on having children, not to like accidentally have children, since having an eclipse in the fifth house of children plus a Uranus transit in the fifth house could indicate like an unexpected pregnancy, for example. Um, other fifth house things could be a romantic relationship or the exploration of the topic of like sex and sexuality in a way that's new to you and sort of exciting or liberating in some way. Um, in terms of the other side of the spectrum, with the eclipses happening in the 11th house, that can be beginning a new chapter in your life for friends and uh, alliances and just groups in general. So you may find yourself either starting some major friendships or alternatively ending some major friendships because sometimes eclipses represent not just new beginnings, but also the winding down or the wrapping up of things that have reached the end of their life cycle. So if there's some friendships where they've been kind of on the rocks, then this could be a period where you see some of them drop off over the course of, of this year. Um, it could also be a good time to get involved in groups and, and sort of associate with like-minded people that have similar interests as you. And in that context, you could find yourself getting involved in new activities or making a lot of new friends and new moving in new social groups as a result of some of these, these eclipses and transits. So the timeframes involved are the first pair of eclipses in, in those houses, the 5th and 11th are in late April and mid-May. And the second pair of eclipses are in late October and early November. So that gives you the time frame where it will sort of open up these six month windows of activity between those two houses or, or that sector of your chart, um, which is going to really put the, the spotlight this year on that axis and some of the topics asso associated with those houses. All right, so that is the eclipses. There's only one other transit that I meant to mention this year, which is the Mars retrograde in Gemini, which is happening towards the second half of the year, starting in August uh, when Mars ingresses into the sign of Gemini, which is your sixth house of work and health. But it really gets going and, and gets intense starting around October 30th when Mars slows down and stations retrograde in that sign. So here's Gemini, which is your sixth house of work and health. There's the Mars transit where it slows down and then it does like a U turn. So the transit kind of begins as soon as Mars goes into Gemini in August. 
Mars transits through the sixth house can indicate a period in which things become a lot busier at work and you find yourself having to spend a lot more hours working or um, you have some anxiety over like a major project that's due that you're working on that ends up taking a little bit longer or having delays and detours that force you to put in an extended or concerted effort over a much longer period of time than perhaps you expected at first. Um, it can also sometimes indicate running into some conflicts in the workplace, or if you find yourself in a managerial position or you own your own company, there could be some tensions when it comes to people that work for you at that time in some sort of subordinate role. Uh, other possibilities for this transit, Mars transits through the sixth house can be health-related, uh, so that could be um, putting in more effort when it comes to your health and physical vitality. For example, starting a new workout re regimen in order to expend a lot of energy, like improving your physical health. That way you can ward off major health issues down the line. Um, the only thing there is you want to be careful because sometimes Mars transits through the sixth can force you to, to push yourself further than you should go beyond your limits. And that can sometimes, especially if you're just starting to work out, cause you to like have an accident or some sort of injury if you push yourself too hard too fast. So just try to pace yourself and try to think about the long term, like the long game, rather than just like immediately having benefits as soon as you start. Mars retrograde transits are ones where Mars usually just zips through a sign of the zodiac in about a month, but here it's going to slow down and it's going to really take its time going back and forth across Gemini over like a six or seven month period. So it's it, the transit starts way back in August, it goes retrograde in late October. It's not going to station direct and get out of Gemini until the earlier part of 2023. So this is kind of a long transit and would be a good idea to pace yourself during the course of it. Um, all right, so I think that's it in terms of the major transits that I wanted to touch on this year and some of the potential themes that could come up. So as always, we're talking about really broad archetypes uh, when it comes to some of this stuff where there's a symbolic meaning and then there's many different possible manifestations of that symbolism based on the unique placements in your birth chart as well as the context of your life. So um, this is something where I would just pay attention to these themes and see how they arise in your life at this time. And once you've identified what the theme is and how it's manifesting, then you can look at the timing and know what the duration is and have some sort of idea for how long that transit is going to last and potentially what some of the more constructive uh, manifestations of it might be versus what some of the more challenging manifestations of that transit might be. But if you do that, then I think you should have a successful year of 2022. So good luck. All right, that's it for this horoscope forecast for 2022. So as always, this was just a general forecast that focuses on some of the broad outlines of the year ahead. So if you'd like a more detailed analysis of some of the general transits this year, then be sure to check out our year ahead forecast for 2022 that we released in December. Uh, additionally, for a more detailed analysis of your chart, you might want to get a consultation with an astrologer because they can look at it in much more detail than I can go into here in just a general horoscope. Alternatively, or better yet, you could also learn how to read your birth chart and transits on your own, which would allow you to pinpoint some of the dates involved with much more precision and exactness. So if you'd like to learn more about my approach to astrology, then you can get a copy of my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune. And in this book, I reconstructed the original system of Western astrology and recovered some techniques that we had lost uh, many centuries ago. So with this book, I sort of teach you how to read a birth chart and how to use different timing techniques in order to determine when different things will happen during the course of your life. Or in some instances during the course of a single year, as I've attempted to do in this horoscope forecast. So the book is available on Amazon as well as in other fine bookstores everywhere. I also teach an online course on ancient astrology, which has over 100 hours of video lectures. Uh, it shows hundreds of different example charts in order to show you how the different techniques work in practice. 
And it really gets into details that I couldn't go into as much in my book, even though the book is very big. Uh, in the course, I actually get into a lot more example charts, which really gives you better hands-on experience of how to use astrology to read birth charts in practice. So you can find out more information about that at courses.theastrologyschool.com. And finally, I also recently released my 2022 electional astrology report, where I went through the year and I picked out some of the most auspicious or lucky dates uh, with one lucky date or electional chart for each of the next 12 months. So these are useful for starting different types of ventures and undertakings using the principles of electional astrology. The report is also available at courses.theastrologyschool.com. All right, so that, that's it. So thanks for watching. Good luck in 2022, and may the stars be ever in your favor. A special thanks to all the patrons that supported the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, thanks to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Sumo Kopic, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Morgan McKinsey, and Kristen Otero. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons, or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrology podcast. The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. Also, special thanks to our sponsors, including the Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is available at mountainastrologer.com, the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, and the Astrogold Astrology app, which is available for both iPhone and Android at astrogold.io. There are also two major astrology conferences happening this year. The first is the Northwest Astrological Conference, happening May 26th through the 30th, 2022, near Seattle, Washington. Find out more information at norwak.net. And the second is the International Society for Astrological Research Conference, which is taking place August 25th through the 29th, 2022, in Westminster, Colorado. And you can find out more information about that at isar2022.org.